thanks for joining us today. Uh, I want us to give a warm round of applause to both Professor Doe and John Stoner for joining us today. So we showed up. We'll see. What do you want? That's the first. Show it up. First step. Every journey begins with the same. So, the Center for Global Leadership and the Center for Marketing and Public Policy Research are heavily invested in bringing in individuals from the business community, from government, from the nonprofit sectors to talk to you within in this course, within the confines of this course, about issues that are facing their businesses and the broader global climate. We are very fortunate to have John here today, who brings a wealth of experience and who's uh, been very active with the Center for Global Leadership and Villanova in general, uh, to bring his experience to the table. We're very fortunate to have you here today, and I want to thank you, John, for this. I'd like to introduce my friend, uh, Jonathan Doe, to give a formal introduction for John. So, John. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Um, it's our pleasure to be here with you. We've been looking forward to this for a couple weeks. We had a little tele telephone call a few weeks ago to talk about what we might accomplish. Um, and so I thought what I would do is maybe start just giving you a couple highlights about John and his background and career. Uh, and then we're going to pose a couple questions to you, not to be answered now, but that we're going to revisit at the end of the discussion. So I'll just say a few things about John, and he'll tell you a little bit more about his background. But he is currently a principal, a partner in McKinsey and Company. How many of you have heard of McKinsey and Company? Okay, about half of you. McKinsey is really the kind of premier global strategy consulting firm. McKinsey uh, competes with, although maybe would, McKinsey wouldn't argue their competitors, but like Booz Allen, Boston Consulting Group, you know, the real leading edge consulting firms. He comes from a military background. Um, he was uh, 18 years in federal service in the military. He um, uh, was assigned to a series of line command positions in, uh, in various uh, 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 situations. Um, he, uh, at one point of his career, was a senior military assistant to Vice President Gore, where he had responsibility for carrying the so-called football that contains, I understand, all the secret codes if something were to, to go wrong. I can't tell you. Uh, right, you'd have to kill me. Um, uh, at McKinsey, among his core clients are the U.S. Department of Defense, one of the world's largest airlines, a leading waste management company, and one of North America's uh, Class I uh, railroads. Um, so he has a diverse uh, set of clients with McKinsey. Um, his educational background is a bachelor's degree with honors in engineering from West Point, a master's degree from Harvard, another master's degree in strategy from the U.S. Army School of Advanced Military Studies. And as John mentioned, he's on the advisory council of the Center for Global Leadership, which I head up. So I, I, our discussion today, I believe, is going to be a little bit broader and a little bit uh, more oriented towards foreign policy, security policy, really like what's going on in the world around us. Some of which rates, relates directly to business, some of which may relate a little bit more indirectly to business. And part of our goal here in our discussion with you is to help you begin to think about the connections between what may seem a little distant and unrelated, but I think we're going we're gonna to assert maybe uh, quite uh, front and central. So as I mentioned, uh, John and I were talking this afternoon. We decided to begin with a couple, a couple questions. And we're going to throw these out to you. We may uh, take a little vote on one of them. And then what we're going to do is we're going to revisit them at the end and see if there's anything that we've discussed that might help you answer them uh, better or differently. So the first one has to do with this thesis of the world being flat. When I gave my little introduction a couple months ago here, I think I alluded to Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat. Have any of you heard of that or read about it or you read articles? Friedman essentially argues that as a result of economic integration, political changes, the fall of the Berlin Wall, a technological innovation, that really business is seamless around the world, that we live in this integrated, uh, fully connected world without sharp geographic or other kinds of divisions between and among people's communities and countries. So he says the world is flat. Now the conventional view, of course, is that the world is round, that distance still matters that geographic distance matters, that cultural difference, distance matters, that political distance matters. So is the world flat, is it round? Or a third point of view, a third perspective is, I'm looking for a marker, not seeing it, that's all right, uh, is that it's spiky. What does spiky mean? Spiky means that there are concentrations of economic activity in particular places, or concentrations of conflict and other kinds of activity in particular regions. So if we were to look at a map of the world uh, um, and use um, satellite imagery to pick up 
where patents are filed. We see heavy concentrations in New York, in Tokyo, uh, etc. Or if we were to look at population, clearly we'd see heavy concentrations around the world. Or if we would look at conflict areas, we'd see concentrations. So I, I hope you're following me. Here is the world flat, seamless, globally integrated, globally connected. Is it round? Distance still matters. We still need to go places, meet people, do business face to face. Or is it, are there concentrations of activity, different types of activities, with large areas, say sub-Saharan Africa, with little activity, at least little economic activity? That's question number one. And John may uh, start by taking a little poll on that one, so we pre be prepared to vote. Question number two, completely different type of question. What did Secretary of State Clinton hope to accomplish on her visit to Southeast Asia and East Asia? And was she successful? in accomplishing what she set out to. What did Secretary State Clinton hope to accomplish on her visit to Southeast Asia and East Asia? And uh, was she successful in meeting those objectives? Okay. And question number three is, what do those two questions, and whatever else we may take up in the next hour, or hour and a quarter, mean for you? <coughs> what do the answer to those two questions, and the other topics that we hope to hit upon in the next hour or so, what do they mean to you? And just a quick illustration here. I'm a terrible uh, art artist. But if we were to look at, say, the United States and think about, you know, that looks more like a dog than the, than the United States, doesn't it? But that's OK. So, so the, world, the world being spiky, if we were to look at patents, we would see sharp spikes in certain places, sharp, sharp spikes of economic activity or political activity with large areas of, of inactivity, of inactivity. So that's the notion of the world being spiky. Please don't re reproduce that or <laughs> take a picture of it and show it to anyone. So with that as, as introduction, you, I see many of you have written those questions down. That's great. We'll come back to them. Let me turn things over to uh, Mr. John Stoner. John's going to tell you a little bit about his own background and career trajectory and then hit on some of the challenging um, uh, issues that I think uh, all global leaders are facing today. So John, thanks for being with us. Sure. Uh, uh, you can decide later if, if uh, I'll have earned any of that or not. I I'm here for you. Uh, and when Jonathan, uh, when we started talking about getting together to do this, uh, I asked him the question, well, what, what would I bring? And what is it that you could take from a conversation that I hope we're going to have over the next hour or so, uh, because I'm quite envious of you. Uh, I don't like it when people, no, no offense, but I don't like it when people introduce me as a person with a lot of experience, because that means I'm old. Uh, and in many ways, you folks are sitting at what may feel a little bit nervous uh, for you right now, but you're sitting at the beginning of an opportunity set uh, and a rich uh, experience base that I don't think you can really even imagine. And I thought what I would do is just share with you a little bit about what I've done and how my view of the world has changed over the last 30 years or so in the hope that it, it will open your eyes a little bit, hopefully a lot, but it'll open your eyes to some different ways of thinking about your future when you graduate. Uh, and I am a friend of Villanova. I didn't go here. I, as Jonathan uh, mentioned, I went to West Point, which is not really college. It's kind of like reform school, and you don't have to pay for it. But my oldest daughter, Kelly, just graduated here in the spring, and my younger daughter, Ellen, is a sophomore in the nursing program. So at least a lot of my money comes here, and I feel like I've got a close relationship with her and all that. I uh, originally went to West Point because my parents couldn't afford to send me anywhere else. My dad had been in the Army for a 1,000 years or so. I'm one of four kids, so I went to West Point because that was the way I could get an education. And I like uh, being around tanks. I'm a tank officer. Anybody ever seen a tank up close? Well, for a lot of you, it's some boring. But you know, bigger boys, bigger toys. It's you know, big. It's heavy. You can run over things. It's really cool. So that's what I decided I'd like to do. Uh, and I was hoping never to have to grow up. The army is actually kind of a unique place. I was in the army. I was on active duty for 18 years. Spent a lot of time in Germany. Actually studied in Austria. I have a master's degree. Uh, that I finished at Harvard, but I started at the University of Salzburg in Austria, wore a full beard, that sort of thing. Um, so I got to run around in the woods, crush things, you know, act like a little boy only in a big boy's tank. And then, believe it or not, I got to do a bunch of interesting things while I was in a, on active duty um, that caused me, it, it's basically it's a part of the fabric of who I am. 
Uh, and when I left the Army, I did so, I was at the White House at the time and working uh, directly for uh, Vice President Gore. I did so because my daughters were getting to be high school age and I wanted them to be able to go to one high school. So that's the only reason I quit running around in the woods. Have you, any of you ever heard of the emergency satchel or the football? But it, it literally, there's a military officer who's with the president and one of the vice president at all times who has with them everything that's needed in the event of a national emergency. Have you seen the movie Air Force One? Harrison Ford, there's that guy, he's got the thing strapped and he gets shot. <laughs> Part of the movie I hate, but <laughs> at any rate, uh, I also had a role uh, with Gore, which was different from President Clinton's aides, different from uh, uh, President Bush and Vice President Cheney, which was a traveling foreign policy advisor because of my educational background. Literally, when he traveled, I was the person with him who uh, advised him on things, current events, etc. What's going on? Not that he needs that. Uh, if you want to see a scary, smart guy, whether you agree with his politics or not, uh, Al Gore is a scary, smart guy. Let's get to the interesting part. When I left uh, the Army, I wanted to get some business experience. I wanted to uh, essentially convince companies that I could be productive and that I could add value and that they should pay me. Uh, and coming out of the Army at the time, 10 years ago, that was a little bit awkward because they don't know what a tank officer can do other than run over things and you know, all that sort of thing. So I came to McKinsey, which is a <coughs> general management consultancy, and I thought I'd stay at McKinsey for two years and just get some business experience. How many of you have not heard of McKinsey? It's a fair question and it's okay, you don't have to, because I didn't know anything about it. It literally, we are essentially outsourced uh, advisors, outsourced hired guns, smart people who can do things coming in from an outside perspective. And a lot of our client work is oriented on solving tough problems that the very senior leaders of a company want to tackle, but either don't have the people or the expertise to do it. And so I thought, okay, I'll try this for a couple of years. I learned in that process I have a very short attention span. I've got ADHD professionally. When I was in the Army, I changed jobs all the time. I think I had maybe, I think I counted them up once 24 jobs during the period of time I was in the Army. So I, you know, you change a lot. And I realized that when I came to McKinsey, I could do a lot of that. I could move from one opportunity or one problem set to another. Why does that matter? To the subject that Jonathan laid out for you, to the topic of what does this all mean for you, I thought I would just lay out what I've done since I came to the firm and then describe for you my current work. Because if you know McKinsey, and most of you do, and some of you I've tried to describe it to you, you would think that what we do is we go to that railroad client, we go to that big airline, and we help them solve business problems, right? That present value calculations. Uh, run the model, figure out the spreadsheet. But in fact, what I've found over time is that's table stakes. That's the basic stuff. You all have to have that. And the work that I'm doing now is actually radically different from that. And it's a surprise to me. And it's something we hope to share with you. We hope to actually sort of inoculate you with some of those insights today. I help to run our manufacturing practice. The manufacturing practice, you might call it the lean practice. We basically were experts at going into a factory and helping them reorganize it and be more efficient at it. It also builds on a set of skills called the Toyota production system. Have you heard of that? The lean production system, the Toyota production system. What, what, can you describe it? Or It's, like a, it's basically like a bunch of different guidelines. Yeah. They stream on there. yeah, it's almost common sense applied, yeah. right? So in your apartment, you all live off campus, right? Where do you put your coffee cups relative to the coffee maker? Right next to it, right? Why? Well, because it's efficient, right? I'm trying to make it fairly tangible for you. But the Toyota production system begins with the customer. So what is the customer value? What do you want? And how can I organize my business system to provide that to you at the lowest cost with the most flexibility so that I can, quote, delight my customer? Now, that sounds sort of silly you know, for example, to like my customer. But in fact, if my customer is really happy with the products that I'm producing, and if I can organize my business system in a way that it's to my advantage and I can be profitable, then I'm only going to become more profitable. What's the real problem with General Motors right now? What's the real problem with General Motors? Anybody? Huh? Their costs are very Their costs are very high. I agree. That's one of them. What else? They don't produce the product that they want. No, no offense to anybody who owns one, but who wants to buy a GM car? That's the real problem. 
because then what happens is their costs get too high because they can't sell the inventory and essentially the, the business system, it implodes, right? It falls in on itself. So if GM were more oriented on the Toyota production system, they would start with the customer first, design a product that they know customers want, and then build the business system behind that to deliver it. That's what I do. That, that's what I do. But you can apply this logic, you know, the simplistic version, the simplistic idea of the coffee maker and where the coffee cups are, that's quite simplistic, but you can apply it to almost anything you do. You can apply it to the way that a, uh, a finance company makes loans, processes loans. Do you know what the average touch time for the normal bank loan process was? Uh, my date is about two years old. Let's say it takes 90 days to get a loan for your home, a mortgage loan. How much of that time do you think it's actually being touched by someone, worked on by someone? Take a guess. 90 days, just for fun. Guess bad, go really like something absurd. <laughs> Um, I don't, I don't know. Anybody? Anybody? 70. 70. So it's six hours. Yeah, it's really, really, really low. So why can't you get a loan in a day? It's because that business system doesn't follow these, these concepts. It's not that well organized, it's not that efficient. So you can take that lean concept and you can apply it anyway. So that's the core of what I have been doing at McKinsey, and I have been doing it for a decade. However, in recent years, I've started to serve a radically different set of clients in the public sector. In fact, my most important client now, the one where I spend essentially 90% of my time is the U.S. Department of Defense. I swore when I retired I'd never go back to the Pentagon, which don't ever, you know, don't ever make a promise to yourself. I actually, uh, I spend much of my time now in Baghdad working on economic development trying to essentially get the businesses in Iraq restarted. Now, that's a pretty far piece from my railroad client, my airline client, etc. right? And if I walked in here a moment ago and said, do you believe it or not that somebody from McKinsey, actually a lot of people from McKinsey would be doing that kind of work, would you have raised your hand and said, yeah, I believe it? It's not what McKinsey has been known for traditionally in the past. Not at all. Two reasons. The obvious one, that it's in kind of a dangerous place. It's not that dangerous anymore, trust me, it's not. The crime rate there basically is low as Detroit right now, I think. Wednesday of last week, they only had 10 violent incidents all across the country in Iraq. I don't read about that very much in the paper. But it's also a radically different set of problems. We're not really trying to organize things more efficiently. We're trying to get the economy going again. And so from where I started with McKinsey 10 years ago, I want to get some business experience to now I spend a week per month in Baghdad, Iraq. That's a pretty far distance. And it's that change and what that means for me as a business person and for you as business leaders who are about to graduate from Villanova is what we'd like to share with you today. So this question about is the world flat or round or spiky, it matters. How many of you would have said, you know, it's probably more like flat? Be honest, I mean, there's no point to say it. How come? Why? What? I would say it was flat just because such there's such communication and technological and transportation advances in the past in like 10, 15, 20 years that it doesn't seem like it would be a huge deal. Um, distance doesn't seem like it should be such a huge deal in distance. Yeah, so the geographic distance really doesn't much matter now, does it? I mean, you pick up the phone, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Cell phone, back there. Who else? Who else would have voted flat? I think we should have a forced choice here, John, okay. because this is, this is you know, people kind of opt out. Oh, go, hi, you man. must go to the polls here, okay? <laughs> so how many, again, flat, fully integrated world, seamless communication, Christina said it well, round, the traditional notion of the world, it's, it's, there's distance, it matters, and then spiky, we have these heavy concentrations of activity. Uh, so how many say flat? How many say the world is flat? Thomas Freeman, the world is flat. Hmm. Okay. How many say round? It, you, you must vote. Let me, let me wow, clarify. We're going to get a yeah, lot yeah, of spikies yeah. here. Spiky. Interesting. This is just fascinating. Yeah. That's fascinating. Not, that is not the way that people as old as me would have answered the question. Because yeah. 
I, I see it. Um, I, I would, at, at, you know, when I was an undergraduate, uh, in prison or whatever it was, point yeah. ninety. For me, for me, the the world was right where I was at that time, and. I knew I was going to go to Europe and be stationed in Europe, but that's a long way from here, and I'll get there eventually. It was, you, you, this is interesting to me because you have a very different uh, view of it, which is, yeah. I think, more accurate. I, I think it's more accurate. You're, Christina, is that right? You're, you're exactly right that the way that you think about the world and the way that you think about communicating with one another is radically changed, and the technology supports that. But it also means that you have a frame of mind which is willing to accept it. You, you, you accept that reality, right? But the notion that it's spiky, that there are places where things are really concentrated, uh, is a pretty nuanced view. Pretty nuanced view. OK. So um, this idea of, of uh, change, that even just during the 10 years that, since I've retired from the Army and since I've been at McKinsey, let me go into that a little bit more, uh, a little bit more deeply. Uh, the normal, I, I say the normal American attitude about business or the normal business person's attitude is no longer sufficient. It's no longer as effective uh, as it would have been 10 years ago. So a very aggressive, how many of you heard of a guy by the name of Chainsaw Dunlap? You know that name, right? That name, guy who was a Sunbeam or something like that? Uh, I think so. Yeah, came in, was known for, you know, slashing uh, cost, slashing, head count, etc. That kind of person, right? have you heard anything at all about him in the last few years? Didn't he go to jail for something? Something. Some, he's just kind of gone. He's disappeared from the face of the earth. Well, at one point in time, he was actually a very, fairly well-known business leader and seen as a guy who was innovative and had a radically different view of how you could move a company forward. Well, it's, that, it just doesn't work. It's not effective. And you have to have a developing set of skills that it, with which you can operate in that environment. For example, how many of you have ever been to how many of you have been to Japan? How do you know how to? Um, uh, I watched this happen with the State Department contingent when I was at the White House. Do you know how to accept a business card from a Japanese business person? It seems like a kind of a silly question. For me, it was at first. Any idea? Yeah, that's exactly right. Think about what you do when somebody hands you your business card here in the States. You put, put it in your pocket, maybe put it in your wallet. But you wouldn't put it in your wallet. Okay. To do so for a Japanese businessman, I learned, and I didn't know this, it, uh, it's offensive to just sort of accept the business card and put it away. Actually, there's a little bit of almost, it's not a ceremony, I'm not trying to make it lighter, but you do. You accept it with two hands, just as you said. What's your name? I'm sorry. Kristen. Kristen. Just Kristen said you accept it with two hands. Read it which is something we don't do, right? Read it, and then either hold it in your hand or put it in a place where it's essentially a place of respect. So you could put it in your pocket, but putting it in your wallet was actually it's offensive. Well, so what? Well, it matters. It really matters. And if what you're trying to do is develop a relationship of trust with a business person, and you don't know that, then you, you potentially you ruin that trust. Do you know how to greet someone in uh, Arab culture, in, in Iraq, for instance, in, in Iraqi culture? Do you know how to greet somebody? Anybody? Use your right hand. No, right hand's okay. There, 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 is a, there is something about the left hand. There's a personal hygiene question that in some, but it's a little bit more of a primitive, a little bit more of a primitive society. <coughs> Believe it or not, hand over your heart. It's, 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 it's appropriate to, to uh, greet them with your hand over your heart. And then essentially what you do is you wait and see if you're going to be offered a hand to shake. Almost always true with the men that they will shake your hand. With a woman, a man needs to wait and needs to not be so forward. In an American business setting, you, you know, sort of walk around and say, hey, how you doing? I didn't get your name, what's your name? Sean. Hey, Sean, how are you? Right? Are you? Our man shake, right? You look him right in the eye. That's, that can be uh, completely inappropriate. Simplistic little examples, but it gets back to this Dunlop, this chainsaw guy, right? His methods are totally outdated. They're totally ineffective. These two little examples are they're quite simplistic. But you have to be aware of this, and you have to understand this for you to be successful. How many of you attended to um, 
try to find a position with international responsibilities. Okay? Half and half, a little more than half. Almost all of you will, at some point in time, have responsibility that has some international component to it. Even if you don't anticipate that you want to live overseas or, or uh, work overseas, you're going to have that component. So you have to have the sensitivity. You have to have this ability. So that's the argument I'm making. Right now, Harvard Business School, the, um, uh, the, the applications right now, they are accepting younger and younger and younger students. We track this pretty carefully at McKinsey, trust me. They are, they are basically, they are accepting younger and younger students, so those with less and less experience, and more and more who have experience in the public sector or the social sector, like Habitat for Humanity, uh, UNICEF, etc. Why is that? Why is that? What's, what's HBS doing? Why would they be good? Please. Are you looking at flexibility and adaptability to unknown situations? I think that's absolutely right. What's your name? Christine also can be yeah. John, so everybody can see. Okay, that, that's absolutely true. They're also, though, reacting to the criticism that they took over um, skilling and Enron, etc. By the way, he was in McKinsey at one point in time. We don't, we're not very happy about that. But they're responding to the criticism that they've taken that they are essentially raising business leaders who have this sort of cutthroat attitude and who aren't values oriented, who don't have ethics. Well, that ought to be a strength. That is a strength of the Bill and Hope graduate. But that's what they're reacting to. Which, from our perspective, again, that's a pretty radical change from just a few years ago. So, where, where, where does this leave you? Let's, I'm, I'm thinking about skipping into question number three and asking for your opinion about how does this affect me? Is, is this news to you? Or is this like, okay, duh, I get it? That's what my daughter would say. <laughs> what do you think? I'm going to get your name first. Yeah. Nicole? Not Christina. <laughs> so, <laughs> nice. You know another name. Okay. Um, I think we've all heard a lot about how important global influences are to us and how much it's even going to be more and more important and more and more widespread as we continue in our careers. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people who have IB co majors and stuff know a lot more about it than maybe some other majors in the school, but I think we've all been exposed to it to some degree. Yeah, that's our international business yeah. co major, which about 25% of our students. How many of you are our international business co majors? So, a lot of you, yeah. Um, do you have international experience already? Have you been on no, an internship? I personally already? don't. Who has? So I've heard a good number. Who traveled the furthest? <laughs> Australia. Would have been Australia? South Africa. Where'd you go? Melbourne. Bombay? Oh, Melbourne, Australia. Oh, I thought you said Bombay. <laughs> I was going to say, wow, that's adventurous. Because that, we, um, uh, we are very aggressive. We are very active in India ourselves, meaning McKinsey and... Um, not so that you'd be an adventurous sort to be there. Um, where else? Anybody been to India? Yeah, okay. That's fair. <laughs> 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 that fun. You were going to ask where? Yeah, well, I was in Hong Kong, Beijing. What did you do there? Uh, studied first semester abroad and then took language in Beijing for some time. Mm -hmm. um, he's fluent Mandarin? Not fluent. He's one of the Darnest languages is really Okay. John, I wonder if you might reflect a little bit about some of the kind of the broader political um, developments going on around the world, which sometimes seem a little bit far removed from the day to day challenges that we all face, you know, getting up and getting to our jobs and our studies, but that I think and I believe you, you also uh, believe, you know, do, do affect us in, 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 in direct ways and indirect ways. This is actually where you and I started the debate here about a month ago about whether I could add any value at all because I'm a na my background is national security and my master's degree at the Kennedy School of Harvard is a master's in, in uh, public administration. It's essentially a foreign policy degree. The same is true for my strategy degree, et cetera. So my background prior to coming to McKinsey was not in business. I don't hold an MBA. Um, and this was actually one of the points that Jonathan and I talked about, which is the effect that the international political environment is going to have on uh, business leaders and on companies that you'll be a part of uh, in the future. Um, so uh, that has changed radically um, in just the last five or six years. I've been a member of a steering committee recently 
uh, at a place called the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, you see looking at what's called fragile states, the question of fragile states. And a fragile state is one, obviously, that hasn't yet kept over into, um, into chaos. You, you know, um, I would say that Pakistan and Afghanistan are two that have kept over. But there are states that haven't yet kept over into the chaos. And what is it that could be done about those states to try to stabilize them such that they don't contribute to uh, that sort of uncertainty? And what we're finding more and more and more often is that those conditions of those nation states affect companies in the United States, in the international business system, quite a bit more than was the case previously. Um, China is another one which, uh, my favorite actually, because my sense is that we've become indebted to the Chinese uh, to such an extent that the, policy, the domestic policy decisions that the Chinese government takes now will directly affect us. And so that, uh, that environment, that uncertainty that you're entering into in your business careers is going to have a greater effect on you than would have been the case five or ten years ago. And this group seems to be uh, actually already aware of that, uh, this notion of the spiky context. John, is, is Mexico a fragile state? And if so, should we be worried, we'd be worried about it? And, and what can we do about it? I've traveled to Mexico a lot, not so much recently, and it seems that the, the, the national security environment, or the security environment, has really deteriorated so, so, so extremely that it reminds me a little bit of Brazil and Argentina several years ago when people are leaving, money's leaving. How many of you have been to Mexico? Many Americans have, obviously. You're in California, you go across the border, right? You think of going shopping and going to Acapulco for vacation, but in a lot of part of Mexico, there's some really, really bad things going on. I think it is fragile. I think it's very close to, to kipping over, in fact. Um, the relationship between the drug cartels and the police and the government there is very, it's, it's, it's quite dicey. I'm, uh, one, of the, one of the associate partners I work with most closely, his brother was a police chief. Uh, and he was killed recently, and he was killed in retribution for um, the outcome of the kidnapping of the same McKinsey colleague of mine, his father, three years ago, and the process in which they got their father released, left hard feelings, and then they came back and killed his, his brother. So yeah, I, I absolutely believe it's fragile. Uh, and in fact, much closer to kipping over than we believe it is, and it's right there on our border, one of our major trading partners as well. And, and, uh John, I, you know, I have a little background with NAFTA and economic relationships with Mexico, but I'm much less knowledgeable about immigration issues and the, and the, national, and the, and the security issues and the narcotics issues. What, what kinds of relationships have you seen in Mexico and other fragile states between the U.S.'s economic engagement on the one hand and the security um, and governance concerns, let's call them, on the other? It used to be that the economic would dominate. Mm -hmm. um, and I still think that that's... Uh, quite important, but the security dimensions are becoming more and more important. The relationship with Mexico and the question of immigration is one that, uh, uh, that is now almost almost more important than the economic component of it, I guess. I, I'm sort of uh, very skeptical about what's going to develop there. Yeah. I'm curious about the reactions of the group, though, to, to this discussion. Does this surprise you at all, or would you debate it with us about that? The relationship with Mexico, for example, the relationship with China. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think the implications of having such a fragile state with Mexico so close to our borders are for our, like, the international policy? Yeah. I guess the first, I, I almost consider it to be a distraction from the business, you know, from the business relationship. And so um, it's that component of it which I think is going to be the most uh, noticeable and quickly. Right? So uh, the question about how open do you have that border, for example, is a security question as much as it is an economic one. And it feels to me as though there's going to be some uh, it, it, that we're going to continue to uh, be distracted by the security question as opposed to thinking about the economic relationship. One would suppose, that, you know, given Christina's view, that the world is essentially flat, or as we were talking about earlier, you know, this connection ought to be essentially seamless. And yet now, that's a barrier, that's a potential hurdle that, uh, from my perspective, harms the relationship, the, the beneficial economic relationship. Yeah, please. Uh, the, back on the China side, 
Do you think that the implication with Taiwan and our more allegiances with them militarily and the whole situation with, you know, China and Taiwan and their supposed conflict that nothing's probably ever going to happen with, what are the implications if, if anything were to go, you know, wrong there or especially from a business side and the security side? Yeah, I'm curious about your attitude. I, I think it is going to become an issue. I think. Um, I'm gonna. I'm curious about your own view because you've spent more time in China than I have. I've been there a couple times, but you you've spent much more time there than I have. But it feels to me as though the, our relationship with Taiwan is one that the Chinese will continue to be very skeptical about, very concerned about, and the way that they could then influence us could be economically, right? So this is a security question for China, and yet they can uh, basically they can influence our relationship with Taiwan. <coughs> through the economic leverage they have. I, I kind of feel the same way, because I really don't think they're ever going to get militarily involved with Taiwan, mm -hmm. but since we have so much interest over there and vice versa, that they can kind of influence through the economic side and the business side what the relationship could be and yeah. you know possibly even get it reprieved. You know, Paul Art, we still have some military force over there. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah. Which is a pretty far cry from what you would have expected, right? In other words, you would think that this is simply a security question, but the economic component of it is becoming more and more and more important. Right? Do you think a lot of the, um, you know, the new bail package, a lot of the money you know, could be coming from China, how much should the, our treasuries they own and everything? Do you think that has something to do with it, their increase? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I have no idea how we're going to pay for $787 billion worth of uh, stimulus. I'm not sure. You can tell my attitude about it, probably. We could debate that, maybe. I'm just I'm. I don't know where the money comes from. And a logical answer is uh, overseas investors who buy our bonds, uh, and uh, then we become beholden to them, right? It's like borrowing money from your parents to buy a car, you know. And then oh gosh, now they can threaten to take the car away. That should get an accident, you know. And doesn't really trouble. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Doesn't work with my daughters. I know that. John, maybe uh, returning to an area where you've had a lot of recent experience, um, you know, the Obama administration has uh, essentially pledged to um, redouble its efforts in Afghanistan, and there's going to be 17,000 more troops sent there. And you know, many people say for good reason. If you look at you know some of the the maps that show uh, who's in charge where, and but what does that mean for a relationship with Iraq? And is that does that concern you that we're maybe uh, ramping down too fast? Yeah, the, um, the, the, the most significant, it does. I, I worry a lot about Afghanistan. Anybody read the USA Today routinely? I see the journalists here. If, if you do, the, there's a, an editorial today by a guy by the name of Ralph Peters, who's in the Army a long time ago, and he's a real kind of smart alecky guy, uh, kind of got an attitude, and he writes in there that essentially becoming more involved in Afghanistan is the stupidest decision that we're taking, that we're going to take in decades. His argument is that it's going to be not only like another Vietnam, it's going to be worse than another Vietnam. And the reason is because it's very difficult to have, to gain leverage in Afghanistan. So the economic development work that we're doing in Iraq, it's been focused on industrial capability that the Iraqis did, in fact, have. I was surprised at how, um, and I don't know why, uh, but I, I was caught off guard by the fact that almost all of the Iraqi business people with whom we work are highly intelligent engineers. These are people who they, they really get, they understand it. And they've been in a different business system all their lives. But they're smart people. And I'm not sure why that caught me off guard. I started doing this work two and a half years ago. So I mean, I've been up to Iraq uh, for, for, for an extended period of time. But in Afghanistan, you have a radically different situation. There is not an industrial base that you're going to try to revive. There is an agricultural economy <coughs> With very little, um, uh, very little manufacturing, very little industrial capability, they don't have an electric grid, and so you can't find a point of leverage with which to start the work. And by the way, th there's a lot of Afghans who don't really want to change. They they like society and they like the culture that they have currently, and that's what they want to keep. And so, it's a very dangerous thing to try to. Uh, you could establish security with the additional soldiers, and once you've established security, then you'll be able to decide what to do. But whether you can actually cause the economy um, to stabilize there is a radically different question. In Iraq, the current concern of the, the military command is uh, that we'll do something too quick. 
so the level of violence has come down substantially in Iraq. Uh, life is radically different now for Iraqis. Most Iraqis, they want to be left alone. They just don't, they, they want to be left alone. And you know, it's pretty easy to understand that. But if we pull out too quickly right now, what happens is we create a, a vacuum, and what will happen is that uh, that security situation will erode. That's the real concern. <coughs> So trading Iraq for Afghanistan right now, in my opinion, would be a pretty bad idea. And these things take a long, long time. It's going to take a decade before things are even close to remotely normal in Iraq, even given the, the, the substantial change in the culture or the environment around there. Yeah, please. Do you think that a lot of the um, situation in Afghanistan now, sort of, if we get more involved in there, like the Russians were doing in the 80s and they <coughs> couldn't take it over, you know, everything over? really nothing to work with. And then if, now that you have Iran on one side, Pakistan on the other, you're going exactly like it's too much. So do you think that it's, what are our real main goals there, just security or economics or yeah, what is it? I, I think it's mis I, I think it's dangerous. I, I was going to say misguided. That's probably too strong. I do think I, I respect the, the idea. And I'm probably going to be in Afghanistan next month, by the way, because we've been asked if we could come help with the, the economic question there. So I'm of being a little flip in my answer, but it feels to me as though the more uh, the more incendiary, potentially the more incendiary place right now is Pakistan, um, and uh, that the radical, you know, the the fundamental viewpoint there is going to be more dangerous to our interests in the region. Um, I think Iran just likes poking fun at us, basically. And they have very, very strong influence in the Shia community in Iraq. Very strong influence, especially in the south around Basra, which makes sense. Where's the oil? Down south. Yeah, and up in Kurds, in the Kurdistan, Kurdish region. Um, so, what you see there is uh, the Iranians have a very, very strong influence in Iraq, but they're really not that serious about it as long as their economic interests aren't. Uh, they're, they're using the Shia. They're playing the Shia card, but essentially they're protecting their, their economic interests. And that's fine for them. And poking a stick in our eye is kind of fun for the Iranians, so that's what they'll continue to do. It's my, my view anyway. But in Pakistan, that's unstable. That one's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like vibrating, and it's gonna, that could get really dangerous very quickly. So you think establishing security, I mean, they might have to, I don't know what's gonna happen with the border situation, but it's kind of iffy, but is that gonna take too long and it'll to even, stabilize things there and with the Taliban down south to really right. start getting any economic things yeah, going. I'm not, yeah, I'm very skeptical about it. 17,000 additional troops. Uh, General McKiernan, the guy who's in charge there, says that's about two-thirds of what I think I need. And uh, I think that'll be enough to secure the cities, but you can't secure those border regions. Have you seen the, the, the news footage of what those border regions look like? I mean, they're, they're mountains like you can, just can't believe. It's, it's so, it's such rugged terrain that trying to you know, trying to secure that area is nearly impossible. Yeah. Chuck, we talk about Russia for a minute. Gloomy in here now. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come back to some more positive. Uh, but but Russia is a place that I've been concerned about for a long time, even when many <coughs> business colleagues have expressed a lot of enthusiasm. And my my take, and I'm wonder wonder about yours, is that you know one. Um, alternative explanation uh, regarding the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union is that it wasn't about uh, pressure for democratization or freedom or uh, relationships with the outside world, that it was really about falling oil prices and that basically the Soviet Union made a lot of commitments to um, keep the economy humming along until oil prices uh, fell out of the bottom and then suddenly couldn't deliver on those promises and people began to look for alternatives. I wonder if we're seeing something similar today, which is that you know Putin's terribly popular. People seem to be willing to put aside their concerns about free speech and, and a truly you know open economy as long as you know oil prices were going up and by, by and large people you know were, were, were getting better off. But now it seems that at least for a period things have changed quite quite radically. And I wonder if if you see Russia as a as a place of uh, fragility and, uh, and concern. Less so, uh, only, and I haven't studied it all, um, really extensively recently, but he has a smaller base that he's got to pacify. Mm -hmm. So I think, and I think Putin's power is quite substantial and well consolidated, so I think he's going to be able to keep a lid on it, even even given the change in the oil prices. It's just my quick sense for it. Um, the interesting thing, the Iraqi budget for this coming year was written at an oil price of $50 a barrel. And it's now in the low 40s. 
And so even within the space of one year, their budget may basically go in the red. And a year ago, we were all mad at them because at $140 a barrel, they had a budget surplus, which they were storing in our banks, which <laughs> I guess they're sorry for that now, um, that we thought that they were taking advantage of. So it, it, it swings, it has uh, it, it swung pretty sharply. My guess is we'll see reaction from OPEC that will help Putin in mm -hmm. the longer run. Mm -hmm. Because they'll prop up prices by reducing, uh, reducing production. Maybe we could return to the uh, question number two and, and, and uh, chew on that a little bit. If you recall, that was um, what was Secretary Clinton up to in Southeast Asia and East Asia. And um, I, I didn't have an agenda. We didn't have an agenda with that question. I mean, you could take it at several levels, but I wonder if you know you'd read about it, thought about it, and what your what your sense is in terms of what she was hoping to accomplish and whether that did or did not happen. Yes, this gentleman right over here. Do you? Um, well, I know there's a uh, power struggle in North Korea right now because of Kim Jong Il's health, and uh, I was actually surprised. I started re reading about it recently. I was surprised to know that for the last uh, eight years there were essentially no talks about um, about all the issues going down there, nuclear power and things like that, that talks were just stalled from the Clinton administration over the Bush administration. Um, so now that Kim Jong-il's health is deteriorating or deteriorated, um, they're planning on launching, test launching long distance missiles. And I didn't, I mean, it was new that they were a threat, didn't know specifics, but after reading this stuff now, um, and then also that they're suspected of giving missile components to Iran and Pakistan and things like that. It seems like a, it, it seems much more on the, on the brink of, I guess, uh, I don't know if you want to say chaos, but, uh, yeah, than, than I ever thought before. So I was actually going to ask what you think about it. First of all, he's a funny looking dude, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. 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 Somebody, was it on Saturday Night Live they used to? South Park. South Park. South Park. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, by the way, I have a Kim Jong Il story that I want to tell at the end. Okay. We'll leave it. Right. Um, yeah, it's interesting because we've we've taken essentially a pretty arrogant attitude towards the North Koreans for the last several years. You're right. We haven't really we haven't acknowledged them, and and what we've done is instead we've held uh, basically secretive talks. We've had you know a limited dialogue because. Uh, of his saber rattling because of his intent to develop nuclear, some form of nuclear program, maybe nuclear weaponry, and his intent to um, deploy missiles. That is all table stakes, not table stakes, but that's all simply uh, for international pride and recognition from the, North, the, the view of the North Koreans. We have held, the Bush administration, beginning of the Clinton administration, you're right, that that's wrong and we're, you know, we're not going to talk to them. Uh, they're in, they are about to uh, test fire a missile, my understanding is, one that has the range of, could reach Alaska, if, you know, if it worked. <laughs> Some question about whether it will work or not. And, um, and his failing health makes it just that much more unstable because if he dies, the question of succession is, you know, you know I don't know. So, uh, um, in, in fact, some are saying now that, I've just recently read that the timing of this potential missile launch is associated with Secretary Clinton's trip. And he doesn't really care about the missile that much, and he doesn't really need the capability that much, he just wants to get concessions. Mm -hmm. So he's essentially acting up because then we'll react to him. And I think I believe that. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the situation with starvation in North Korea is unbelievable that people are starving just because that government is incapable of taking care of their people and because we've had sanctions and so it's all it's all pretty bad in my so I mean, the combination of I, I think I'm, I'm with Russia I think it's kind of uh, I think that there I think that the war of corruption is still big in Russia uh, but at the same time I think that People like Putin and Medvedev understand business, and they understand that they want to reach the point where they're that they don't have to poke at us and don't have to, you know, start with us. So I, I don't consider them as much of a threat as I would um, North Korea. But how can you take the whole Middle East conflict, North Korea, China, and Russia, 
they're all on the other side of the world, and they all have common interest in in us faltering. I mean, how do we resolve that? How do we? Yeah. So how do we, how yeah. Do we so was Secretary Clinton successful then on the question of North Korea in this most recent trip? <laughs> uh, I think I don't think so. Hmm. Yeah. There's still. It seems like they're still going to flaunt this rocket test in our face. Mm -hmm. and say, you know, we didn't. You didn't do much. I don't know what else went on at the table. I'm, just I'm, I'm sorry, what is your name? Uh, Rob. Rob, I'm just curious what has prompted you to educate yourself as much about this issue. You seem um, quite knowledgeable South and Park. sophisticated. I'm just, I'm just curious. South Park, yeah. um, honestly, I mean, um, with, I've always been interested in Russia. I happen to have, I, I just have, been, I have a lot of Russian friends at home, so I grew up learning a lot about it. Um, the North Korea stuff, I honestly just, Started reading it. Okay, on Black Bear one day and it was interesting. So I, I don't know. It just seems like the combination of all those people over there. Could be Russian corruption is very strong. You mentioned it. it it's um, my uh, McKinsey has global offices, and we have uh, obviously several in Russia. And my Russian colleagues who are partners are really <laughs> kind of quirky. You know, smoke a cigarette in one of those long cigarette holders, and you know, they kind of. Typical stereotype, but the reason is because they are uh, a part of a very small percentage of the population in terms of their financial situation, mm -hmm. and they are joined by you can't say mafia, but by a very very strong criminal oligarchy, which I, I describe it as criminal, uh, but they control business interests so strongly that as long as Putin doesn't upset their apple cart, yeah, yeah, he's going to be able to maintain mm -hmm. pretty good control. Mm -hmm. That's that's how I kind of look at them. Like, they're okay with taking shortcuts, definitely, on yeah. things and, uh, you know, greasing people and, and doing what they have to do to get to the point. Yeah. But I think that their end goal is economic independence. I don't think that they want to be yeah. the... The troublemaker. Fully 11 years ago when I was there with the White House contingent, we had to actually deal with uh, the owners, for instance, of certain hotels to get enough room for our entire Air Force Two and everybody to be able to stay in one place. So whether you liked it or not, you dealt with that mafia boss. I mean, that's the wrong term. But you dealt with the guy who owned the hotel. Why? Because he owned the hotel. And if you didn't, you, I don't know, sleep on the street or something, right? Which for a White House delegation is a little <laughs> awkward. Just returning to the, the trip of Secretary of State Clinton, so she went to you know, Southeast Asia, um, and she also went to China. Um, what, what, what do you think her objectives were, and do you think she accomplished them? What did she have to say when she was in, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I know she spoke with uh, Hu Jintao. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to say it, but um, I know she was speaking with him about the economy. That was one of her biggest focuses yeah. over there. But beyond that, she, I know she moved on to clean energy issues, and she was yeah. also looking into human rights. Speaking of the economy, is that something that would typically fall under the purview of the Secretary of State? Did it, did it surprise any of you that she was really engaged in discussions about the economy when we have you know, the Treasury Secretary and Commerce? Well, we don't have a Commerce Secretary at this point yet. <laughs> We're trying. Um, did you, did you, did, didn't you wonder, geez, is that what the Secretary of State does, or no? Did you think that was appropriate? Any thoughts? Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, I was just going to say it does, you know, fall outside of her boundaries, I think, but it's something that I think um, we need as many people working on as we can mm -hmm. at this point. Um, it's worth it to keep establishing, diff like, better uh, uh, relationships with China. So I think, you know, it may not have been her primary function as Secretary of State, but it's important for her to keep that ball, you know, keep the ball rolling in that respect. To contribute right. to the dial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to say, I was definitely surprised to see her talking about economic issues, but when I start to think about it, seeing her talk to the Chinese about our economic policies, I think she said we rise and fall together. In fact, that foreign policy is almost becoming economic policy okay. at the level of yeah. like treasury bills and stuff that the Chinese hold and their investment in our economy. So like, once I start to think about it, I'm like, you know, it doesn't make sense for the foreign policy to intersect. Yeah. Also. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's that's right on, and I and I think um, uh, you know that has been some, that has been building for some period of time. I guess a more kind of nefarious explanation is that Secretary Clinton is a very strong individual, strong politician, strong personality, and that you know as part of her negotiations over her position, that she you know it was there was a concession that say that you know you, you will have a strong role in in, in foreign economic policy. 
Um, and, and of course, with China, it made sense that she engaged on this. What about the non-economic issues like human rights, Tibet? Remember what she had to say about, about that? Anybody read about that? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, obviously, she's going to poke a little human rights issues and Tibet issues, but that's just an open question to the both of you. I mean, do you think that it's really just the wrong time for her to go in there and start talking about human rights in Tibet when they have this, you know, the economy is obviously number one in the region, maybe some security, and, or do you think she really is to do that or really just trying to assert her, you know, authority right. kind of overseas and, you know, rattling her sort of uh, currency valuation and all that stuff? Do you think my, it's just the wrong time for her? My, my interpretation was that she was being somewhat... Uh, she, she was offering some concessions in raising it in kind of a flip way that signaled that she was decoupling the human rights and Tibet issue from the economic issue. So she said something like, of course you know I'm going to raise the Tibet issue, and of course you know what the Chinese authorities are going to say in response, but you know we shouldn't let that color this broader engagement. So I actually found her tone to be surprisingly soft on the human rights and Tibet issue, especially given what she has said in the past. And so I was quite surprised that she was not more hard-hitting and, and assertive. And she almost poked fun at the fact that it's this recurring issue, and we always kind of beat you up on it, and you always you know, give your pat answer about human rights in the US. And, let's, and she was almost saying, let's put that aside and, and agree to disagree and, and engage on the, on the other issues like the economy and, and clean energy and whatnot. That was my interpretation, but I don't know, John, what, what you thought. It feels like the, uh, I think overall her intent was to set a different tone mm. for U.S. relationships in the region. I think that was, you know, task one, to demonstrate that there's a new sheriff in town, so to speak. Uh, but there are certain topics that a U.S. administration really can't let go of, and this is one of them, mm -hmm. Tibet. So, it's, uh, and by the way, diplomatic discourse like this takes place over a long period of time, so you really can't consider one dialogue or one discussion or one visit as the be all and end all. It's not the end of the conversation, it's a marker in the conversation. And so essentially what she was doing there was just planting that seed. Okay, you know, we're gonna come back to that, but I think you're right that now it's not a very good time for us to be making demands of the Chinese to do things in Tibet. When you know, if they decide to, you know, cash out all their bonds, we're, you know, we're in deep doo doo. Mm -hmm. but, you know, that's a, that's a financial term. <laughs> but you know, it's a strange environment. You all familiar with the terms of uh, what happened with Bretton Woods, the financial uh, agreement back in the mid middle of the, you know, the 20th century? The United States got to dictate a lot of how the international financial system and the economic relationships were going to be formed because we had the money. I mean, essentially, you know, if you have most toys, you win. We got to dictate a lot about the way that the international monetary system was going to work. And that's an outcome of Bretton Woods. It's, all the details probably boring, but that's bottom line. China could conceivably be in that same role now over the next five years, ten years. So if there were a Bretton Woods too, how would China change the monetary, you know, the international financial system to suit its needs in the future? Could potentially be you know, there's a parallel there, which I'm going to be very curious to watch. A little bit scary, actually. The fact that you know some Mandarin is not a bad thing. And in terms of this issue of setting a different tone, do you, do you think that she was successful? Do you think that that if that was one of the objectives or one of the goals, that she she effectively accomplished that? Those of you that follow. <laughs> Yes. No? Christina? Um, I, I do agree with you that I think um, she was being incredibly cautious, um, especially with the human, human rights um, uh, issue, whether that was a smart move to mention it then and there, that's questionable. Maybe she just wanted to plant a seed and revisit it, like you said. Um, but I did think for for the uh, reputation that she has, I think she did go pretty soft. Um, mm -hmm because we are kind of at the mercy of the training at this point. So I was a little surprised. Yeah, was it just that, or was it potentially a, a more genuine effort to kind of disassociate the Obama administration from the previous administration and, and, and strike a different, start off on a different um, chord, if you will? Uh, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't want to make a conclusion 
conclusion? It's hard to know people's yeah. motives, right? You know, we, all we all we can do is look observe the behavior and guess at the motives, right? We don't really know the motive. What were you, you going to say, something? I was going to say it's hard to look at one single visit to yeah. to uh, East Asia and say the whole tone has been changed. Right? Yeah. Especially from like what you've seen. I mean, a lot of you don't really see any concrete results from any of these. True. Sure. Any of these uh, overseas visits. So it's kind of like a lot of people just talking and he says something and then nothing ever happens about it. So <coughs> kind of two or two soon start on that. Right? Let me just say one word, one more word, or one more exchange about this, and then I want to give you an opportunity to, to ask John a couple more questions. What about Southeast Asia? This is a region of the world that I think we don't think a lot about. Um, you know, the, there's been a lot of attention in economic circles on the brink. Brazil, Russia, India, China. Um, some people think some Southeast, Southeast Asian nations are kind of the up-and-comers, maybe the next wave of the large emerging markets. And certainly from a population point of view, there's a lot of population there. Pe people sometimes aren't aware of that. So she did visit Southeast Asia. What were your impressions there? Do you think about Southeast Asia much? And, and, and if you do, what, what comes to mind? And just to be clear, I'm talking about um, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, etc. The so-called ASEAN countries. Do you, do you ever talk about them? Do you ever think about them? And if so, what do you think about them? Yeah, Christine. I think it's been coming up more in my classes. <coughs> mm -hmm. So I've been starting to think about like, Vietnam and Philippines mm -hmm. and um, I think they do have a bit of advantage in the fact that historically they have a relationship with the West. So I think that would be maybe a bridge that a lot of the well-developed countries would try to tap into in Singapore and Hong Kong. And there are already cities that are well-developed, um, but I see maybe like them as a second tier, mm -hmm. you know, home for the countries that are probably going to be up and coming in the next couple of years. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed um, specifically out of that region is tourism. Is one of the growing businesses in the area, and the New York Times has just focused on that a lot recently. So that's just one of the, you know, economic reasons to be interested in them now. Mm -hmm. So that was. And they're and they're lovely places to visit. They, these countries are just lovely places. Those of you that have been fortunate, I've traveled a lot there, but they're they're really wonderful places to visit. I, I think I think fascinating. What else? What else comes? How many people live in Vietnam? Who knows? Yeah. Eighty-five. About eighty-five million. And when I first learned that a couple of years ago, I have a, a daughter adopted from Vietnam. I, I was going to guess 10 million or 20 million. It, it hadn't occurred. I thought of Vietnam as a tiny little country. Um, and it's not. And in Malaysia and Indonesia, obviously, there are hundreds of millions of people. And it's, it's a lot of people in this region. A lot of economic activity. A lot of investment from Japan and elsewhere. Um, and certainly some conflicts and problems, no doubt. But a lot of potential. Thailand right now is going through its you know, sixth round of uh, political instability in the last couple of years but seems to manage it okay. So a, a, a very interesting place that I think those of you that want to would be interested in, in keeping an eye on going forward. Yeah. Um, this is just a narrow perspective, but um, I know in Singapore, uh, they've been doing a lot, uh, a lot of investing in uh, enter entertainment, like entertainment facilities, yep. Yep. the big sports hub. Um, mm -hmm. Even this isn't Southeast Asia, but uh, Macau casinos in China. So I, I think they're, they're trying to build Big, um, big hubs where a lot of Westerners, a lot of people with money can come spend so that they can really reinvest that money and property sales even better. So um, I think there's definitely a lot of opportunity over there. I mean, even, even, like I said, just in sports, you see uh, like the NBA is building arenas in China right now. Um, there's a lot of different sports leagues that are going, going over there, so there's a lot of money going there. Have you been to Singapore? I haven't. Has anybody been to Singapore? It is amazing. I was there last year for the first time. It is unbelievable. I like it. It was a little too yeah. high for me, though. Well, <laughs> it is high. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I went to the um, the uh, front desk in the morning and said, I, I want to go for a run. Can I go outside safely? And the guy just kind of laughed at me. They don't have crime in the streets in Singapore. They just, just don't. Very uh, learned, very uh, open society, very uh, concentrated on... Uh, you know, improving myself through my education and looking out for my family. It's really, I mean, I was, I was really kind of blown away from it. And we stayed in these unbelievable high-rise hotels and just spent the food on the district and got the food on the district. And, uh, it, it just literally had basically grown up in the last five to seven years. Of it was unbelievable. I know, like, you can't, like, buy gum in Singapore without a prescription or something. Uh, yeah, it's true. You know why? 
they don't want it littered in the streets. I chew gum all the time. I have it, but I am now. I can make it literally. I, that's a big deal. They don't. You don't do that. So they don't litter in the streets. Okay. Is there tough communication barriers in Singapore? None. Mm -hmm. No, we are. I, I am remarked. It, it is remarkable to me how many people study our language and how few Americans on a percentage, you know, hard percentage basis, speak another language. Financial centers, all the economic centers are really centered in the cities. And that's it. In Vietnam, we had Ho Chi Minh City in Hanoi. And in China, same thing. Do you, more so than it is here, do you think that that's going to improve at all, at meaning more concentration in the big city and emerging markets, or do you think that it can expand into, you know, say, the central Vietnam, there's really not much economic activity going on? I find it hard to believe that it could expand much beyond the cities uh, just because of the type of uh, economic activity we're talking about. Um, and there's an agrarian, essentially, there's agrarian potential in the remainder of Vietnam, but little additional potential for, for example, manufacturing or, hot, or you know, heavy industry because they don't have the electric grid to support it outside the cities, et cetera. Now, a lot of my clients are thinking about their, what we call the manufacturing footprint. So if you're not going to be doing as much manufacturing in the United States, let's just assume that for a moment. Where could you do it? And what's that footprint so that you can reach your customers? Again, going back to this, this idea about the lean production and the Toyota production system. So where can you get your product to, come, uh, to your customers at the lowest cost? Well, BMW is building cars in the United States because they can save the shipping costs. So their manufacturing footprint supports that. And so Vietnam, as an example, some of these countries in Southeast uh, Asia, we are actually looking at them very carefully for their manufacturing capabilities. But we don't really think about it hard much outside the cities because you have to build a logistical tail to get out that far. And that's the problem. So all the parts have to go out there and then all the finished goods have to go out there. That's the issue. It's a quick reaction, but that... That's the way that I've, we've been thinking about it. And I, and I think more broadly, if you look at the forecast about the emergence or the continued emergence of megacities, for reasons that are inconsistent with the flat world view, there appears to be increasing concentration, as you know, of economic and financial activity in fewer places as opposed to the distribution of it in, in, a, in a broader. And that's happening in this country. More people are living closer to cities. Fewer people are living in, in rural areas. So there must be something about the agglomeration of people and economic activity in close geographic space that makes sense. Now, there can be diseconomies as well, right? There can be points at which this becomes just chaotic. But it's a little counterintuitive, because if we can all work from home and all email and we can you know, trade from our desk in Wyoming, well, why do we all need to be crammed together? There's just, there must be some other reason, and it's all these intangible interactions and communications and knowledge spillovers and all kinds of ways that we relate to each other when we're in, in close proximity. Well, and a business relationship has a component of trust to it that you can't replicate technologically. And th this is something that's taken me a little bit of time to understand better. But no matter how uh, refined the technology, you still have to deal with a human being on the other end of the business system. And that is, I think, what reinforces this point about you can't do business in isolation because you've got to be able to connect with people. And that's a skill, it's an ability that you've got to have. That is a segue to my Kim Jong-il story. Okay. <laughs> so in, uh, in January of 2005, my wife and I were in, some of you may have heard this before, I apologize. We were in, uh, in Guangzhou, China, because we were in the process of adopting our first daughter, who was adopted from China. And when you adopt from China, all of the adoptive parents and children eventually end up in Guangzhou because that's where the U.S. consulate that processes all the visas is located. So they all kind of center on, in Guangzhou, and they center more particularly in a little part of Guangzhou, um, the kind of the old colonial district, and there's this famous hotel there called the White Swan Hotel. And so you go to the White Swan Hotel, and if you're unprepared, you see all these adults that look like me and all these kids that are Chinese, and you're a little thrown off, but then you figure out what's going on here. So we were staying there, and there's a lot of waiting and sitting around when you, when you adopt, a lot of bureaucratic uh, papers to sign and whatnot. And one morning, the person who was facilitating our adoption told us and the other couples that were in our group that we had to exit the hotel. We had to leave the hotel for un unknown reasons. We had to get out of the hotel. We thought, is there a fire? What's going on? Nobody would tell us. We kind of asked around people in the street. No, we don't know. But the whole hotel cleared out. We had to move to the other side of uh, Guangzhou to kind of a business hotel, Marriott or something. So you know, we did a little internet searching, trying to figure out what's going on. But 
Google China did not allow us to gain access to rumors, which later proved to be true, that Kim Jong-il was visiting China, was visiting Guangzhou. So in a phone conversation with our parents, they said, oh yeah, Kim Jong-il is visiting China. We know that here in the US because it's all over the newspapers and, the, and Google and whatnot. But in China, we couldn't learn that until after the fact. Two days later, of course, the Chinese authorities published a report that Kim Jong-il was here and there's pictures of him and what he did and everything. Um, so the, the world was flat, but not really flat. The world was unevenly flat, at least in terms of access to information. Further, we're over in the Marriott, and you know I'm a curious guy, and I'm in, engaged in international business. So again, a lot of downtime in the morning, all these business people. So I remember there's a group from Palo Alto involved in software development, and you know how 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 long have you been here, and what are you up to? Well, we've been here four or five days, and we we thought we were going to conclude this outsourcing arrangement, but things didn't come together quite as we planned. So we had to stay a couple more days to to make sure everything was okay. Well, that's interesting. Unfortunately, you had to extend your trip. Next morning, a group of women from Denmark who were in the textile and apparel trade, and again, they had some business dealings with China. How are you? Where are you from? You know, how long are you to be here? Well, we planned on a week-long trip, but we had to extend for another week because we weren't able to conclude our contract in the time that we thought. You get the story here, right? Not only did these people have to travel to China to do business face-to-face, -face, but they had completely different expectations about how quickly that business transaction was going to be concluded. So my takeaway there is that the world is still round in many respects. Geographic distance still does matter. We still do need to travel and interact with people face to face, especially in other cultures. And that we can't do everything on the internet and electronically and remotely. That that's not going to work in a lot of places around the world. Christina, what were you going to say? Oh, that just kind of triggered um, a funny experience that I had about I also studied from Shanghai in China. And um, our marketing professor, um, Native Chinese, but she had studied abroad in Suffolk, so she had this very interesting mixed accent that I really can't describe. But um, she was very, very westernized from her perspective. How she approached us, um, the way she would just conduct the the class in itself kind of showed us that she was very much sensitive to the Western culture. Um, she was very br brutally honest. What she said was not the the common cultural, you know. Um, thing to do in China. So she would tell us the most honest stories that other professors would never admit to. And um, it was very funny, we were talking about made in China goods and she was asking us what we thought about Chinese products. And one of the students had mentioned um, low cost, low quality. <laughs> and she was um, just very intrigued and asked why. And then um, a couple students had mentioned you know, the, the, the toy factory that had poisoning in it, as well as like the Crest toothpaste company that had uh, a couple rumors going around, she had no idea. She had never heard of any of those stories, was um, <coughs> actually asking our, our sources and the credibility of our sources. Fascinating. And uh, we were like, oh yeah, it was all over the news in the States, and um, there are kids who had you know visited Europe at one point in time, and they said, oh yeah, my relatives in Europe had mentioned it as well. Um, so it was just very fascinating to see this professor who was obviously in the upper echelon um, and was very much hands-on with the government, was doing a lot of projects, and she had no idea what was going on. And on a daily basis, you don't really think China or Shanghai is any, any much different than New York or Washington or Villanova, but I think it was that moment that I just kind of hit me that I was definitely in China. That's great, Christina. I, I'm afraid we're out of time, and I realize we kind of skipped around here a little bit. We touched on a lot of different topics. I'm not sure we, we completely got to what does this all mean for you, but I know that, that we'd be delighted to stay around here a few minutes and, and chat with you if you have further questions. But let's thank John Stoner in particular very much.